video we're going to talk about how we can compose with restrictions in order to subvert our own ingrained compositional technique. As I've already mentioned, I'm going to refer to my composition, Parallax Error, as a case study. So how did this approach affect the sort of music I composed? So I experimented with sounds that sounds. So as we have the glissando, dampen. Now let's look at how exploring something unfamiliar ended up affecting the way I treated the physicality of the instrument in my own compositional approach. Well, you've probably got the point by now. The rhythm and continuously shifting pulse of parallax error arises from a battle between the performer's attempt to perform the notated rhythms, which are intuitively derived through improvisation on the viola, and the logistics of the instrument, which frequently counteract the performer's actions. So in cases where the execution of intricate durations and articulations with saltendo attacks is required, the performer must attempt to follow the notation as accurately as possible, yet allow the saltando technique to reveal hidden, unpredictable rhythms and articulation, and in some cases, pitch. So you might be like, bounce this four times. Ooh, was that an extra one? See so how it's just, you can't predict how or the rhythm is going to be, or the pitch even. should also add that the viola doesn't need to be in tune or any stringed instrument doesn't need to be in tune that's the whole point of this the specific pitches isn't necessary isn't a requirement of the piece which is useful if say a string performer has performed another piece of music which requires the tuning of the strings they can just go straight on to parallax error and play it and it doesn't matter how the tuning should be it doesn't matter now in cases where precise execution of intricate durations and articulation with saltando attacks is required the performer must attempt to follow the notation as accurately as possible yet allow the saltando technique to reveal hidden unpredictable rhythms articulation and in some cases pitch this heightens the perspective that the specific rhythm meter and tempo are viewed as a byproduct of the instrumental techniques employed in order to investigate this aspect of parallax Error further, I asked three specialist string players to play through Parallax Error in various workshop settings. The first took place in the University of Leeds in England by cellist Ellen Fallowfield, who suggested ways in which the notation could represent both my desired sonic outcome, yet also acknowledge the behaviour of the cello. For example, in line 9, here. See, she suggested an exponential crescendo as opposed to the gradual one that I had initially notated. So when the bow goes across this bit, it makes more sense to have her like, push down and get louder and then it can get quieter. It just flows more naturally if we're looking at how, if we're looking at letting the cello dictate the sounds. So she suggested this notation, and this is because due to the logistics of the cello, the crescendo would inevitably be exponential whether I notated it that way or not. That's what she said. Fallowfield's interpretation of parallax error on cello varied a lot from mine on viola. Mine was kind of more, I don't know, bouncy, hers was more experimental. And she was probably using her own preconceived knowledge about how she would approach such a piece of music. It was more... I guess it was more unpredictable. I think the way I perform, you can hear some kind of music in it. That's how it goes to me, but to her it's different. If you want to hear the way I perform it, I'll provide a link down below. But nevertheless, Fallowfield performed something that was recognisably parallax error, fulfilling all the actions requested in the score. She did play the piece. And at this point, I concluded that the overall varied sonic outcome between Fallowfield's interpretation and my own was due to the varied behaviour of the cello compared to the viola. I say I concluded this, I didn't really. I just had to write this for my PhD, because it had to be presented as a research thing. Anyway, the second workshop took place at the Gaudiamus Academy in the Netherlands with cellist Katharina Gross. And Gross's approach to performing Parallax Error involved a desire to understand my thoughts about the piece. So she asked me what I wanted from it. Uh, and, and once we had established that my view of the piece was one of a sense of flow and interruption, or starting and stopping, it seems to flow like it's like it, it, the piece seems to want to go forward but keeps stopping. Uh, whether that's 
because of the instrument or um, just the way it's written down and maybe because of the different sound optics and the way they kind of move on from one another. This sense of flow and interruption sort of comes naturally in the piece. And the performer had to encounter a battle between their instrument and what was notated in the score. Because of this, Gross performed Parallax Era in a similar way to how I performed it on the viola. And this caused me to reconsider my initial conclusion that the instrument was the sole contributing factor to the difference between fallow fields and my interpretations of parallax error. Because by comparing fallow fields interpretation with Gross's, I concluded that it was actually an individual performer's pre-existing knowledge about, or the familiarity with, a piece of music that affected their instrumental technique and subsequent interpretation of that music. And this seemed to govern whether they let the instrument take over more or whether they fought the instrument more to stay true to what I had intended in the music. Which, to be honest, was more of an equal balance between fighting the instrument and letting it do its own thing. Maybe Fellowfield let the cello be slightly more in charge? I quite like that. It can represent this sort of debate about a kind of power struggle between cello and performer. And which one should have the upper hand. The third workshop of Parallax Era also took place at the, Gaudiasm- at the Gaudiamus Academy in the Netherlands, but this time with double bass player Dario Calderon. Calderon's interpretation of Parallax Era was different from Fallowfields and Grosses and my own, but was nevertheless still recognisably Parallax Era. He-, he wasn't really into it, he had a cold that day. His instrument reacted differently from the viola and the cello. It was generally louder, and so directions for piano dynamics were more difficult, albeit not impossible, to control than on the viola and cello. He said that anyway. And it was at this point that I reconsidered my previous conclusions, drawn from Fallowfields and Gross's interpretations of the piece. After working with Calderon, I concluded that interpretation of a piece of music is influenced by a dialectic between a performer's preconceived knowledge about the piece and the physicality of their instrument. So that influences the way they even interpret it in the first place. So it's not necessarily about interpreting the piece and playing it or letting the instrument take more control over how the music sounds. The interpretation of the piece is naturally influenced by this dialectic between interacting with an instrument or the instrument and an interpretation of how you would interact with the instrument. Does that make sense? A performer's preconceived knowledge about the piece and the physicality of their instrument. They're in a hermeneutic cycle. What do I mean by that? Their knowledge influences their instrumental technique, the logistics of which influences their interpretation, and so on. Anyway, let's go on to instrumental technique knowledge and the dialectic. (laughs) In light of these three workshops, I can conclude that Parallax Era presents a battle between the performer's familiarity with their instrument and their unfamiliarity with its non-normative notation and instrumental techniques. These unfamiliar factors contradict the performer's interpretation of the music, governed by a potentially ingrained performance technique, and in doing so present a restriction to their process. This restriction in turn affects their interpretation of the music, now governed by the behaviour of the instrument, and so on, in a hermeneutic framework. The only freedom the performer experiences is that of overcoming the restrictions of their own knowledge and how their instrument should be performed and how the music they are performing should be interpreted. These workshops also demonstrate how the dialectical relationship of familiarity and unfamiliarity and creative freedom and restriction, which I encountered when experimenting with the viola, and subsequently composing Parallax Era, can also be experienced by a trained performer, despite them having pre-existing knowledge about how their instrument should be played. The way in which Parallax Era employs the physicality of an instrument is not unique amidst avant-garde practice in general. Similarities can be drawn between this aspect of Parallax Era and the work of Cassidy, Hubler, Lackenman, Dylan, amongst others. There's loads. These are not exhaustive. In fact, it can be said that this type of instrumental exploration, wherein the music manifests in the instrument's instability, is symptomatic of 
decoupled notation and vice versa. Decoupled notation is symptomatic of the instrument's instability. Like my previous attempts to subvert my own preconceived knowledge about composing and engage with an approach I might not have done had I fallen back on a more familiar compositional technique, this similarity between parallax error and existing avant-garde practice with capital letters is unintentional and therefore demonstrates how focusing on subversion of technique compositional technique in particular, is more likely to produce music that adheres to general avant-garde practice than go beyond it. This investigation <laughs> um, outlines how Parallax Error's threefold attempt to subvert technique on the level of notation, musical characteristics, and the use of the instrument's physicality has failed in all three ways. The conclusion that can be made from this is as follows. Parallax Error's compositional process allows me to engage with newness on a personal level. It persuades me to compose music I would not have composed had I taken a more familiar compositional approach. Parallax Error is not unique in relation to overall avant-garde practice and can be likened to existing pieces such as that of Hübler and Lackenmann. As such, Parallax Error serves to prove the existence of an avant-garde style rather than go beyond it. This is despite my compositional approach focusing on subverting my own pre-existing compositional technique. Where is parallax error now, you might ask? Well, if you want to read more about what I've been speaking about in this video, then I explore it in a chapter in Performing Art, which explores performance as a means for composing music. You can listen to me perform Parallax Error on viola with a follow along score on my music channel here. Parallax Error is also out on CD, performed by Katharina Gross, and you can buy it on Amazon and on the CD publisher's website. I'll provide links under this video. Katharina Gross has performed this as part of her big cello mundo project, which check you should check out. I think it features a piece of cello music from a composer from a different country all over the world. And Katarina Gross is a really lovely person, actually, really nice to work with, really personable. And I like her performance of this piece a lot. She makes it sound more, I think there's a lot more expression in it. Mine sounds a bit dancey and erratic and nervous, but she kind of brings out this suave expression and beauty in it, a bit more romantic. And the sounds are a lot more, I don't know, there's a lot more richer sounds in it. Listen to her CD. Also, if you want to try this in your own compositional approach, in your own compositional practice, then why not grab an instrument you can't play and mess about? <laughs> or perhaps take one that you can play and play around with it in different ways. I've got some other pieces that explore performance itself as a compositional approach that I'll talk about in later videos. So joy <laughs> for you. Anyway, that's me. Done. Thank you for watching. This is despite my compositional approach focusing on subverting my own frequency system. <laughs>